Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. It is time to start a discussion on a new book. I always get so excited uh, when we start a new book. Um, it's uh, this is this is one of my favorite things about the Mythgard. I just love the Mythgard Academy. Um, I get to talk about things I would not normally get the chance to talk about, uh, and uh, uh, really think and work through books that uh, you know I've never really kind of worked my way through and stuff. Anyway, just love it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sorry, my background is not thematic. Uh, I know. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but um, anyway, uh, it's, I'll try to have a more thematic background next time. <laughs> Something a little more lunar, uh, perhaps, next time. Um, uh, you're right, Bruce, there is at least a moon <laughs> behind me, right? I suppose that's something. Um, but anyway, um, uh, welcome everybody. And of course, first I want to thank uh, the person that I have to thank uh, for this particular uh, uh, for this particular discussion. Uh, Curtis Wyant has been wanting, hoping uh, to get a Heinlein book discussed uh, in the Mythgard Academy uh, for a while, <laughs> many years, uh, and uh, although he's had some success in uh, his, uh, uh, you know, in uh, voting and uh, uh, trying to win over folks, uh, if I remember correctly, he was the one who nominated Ursula Le Guin's Dispossessed, uh, which was a really uh, awesome discussion that we did there. Um, uh, so I know, Curtis, you've had some success in helping to bring uh, some more uh, uh, really fascinating science fiction uh, uh, to our uh, to our discussions. Um, but um, he uh, he 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 finally he finally pulled a unilateral uh, uh, pitch on this one and called a Heinlein book, um, uh, which uh, was I I am uh, I am delighted to do. Um, I really enjoy the Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Um, I have only read it twice. Um, I read it once uh, several years back, and of course I read it again recently. Um, and uh, I have really enjoyed it both times, and I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about it. So yes. Uh, uh, Curtis Arthur uh, Harrow is is uh, uh, wanting to express his personal gratitude to you uh, for making this happen. I know he was so from the first moment I announced it, Arthur was cheering in the background. I know, um, uh, and I know there were there were others as well. I was just talking to this afternoon who uh, uh, who were excited to hear that we're uh, doing some classic science fiction, uh, which is a, a really uh, good and excellent change of pace here uh, for the Mythgard Academy. So. Um, yes, we are going from uh, uh, from uh, from the hell uh, from hell up to the first sphere of the heavens, uh, up to the moon, uh, which is rather different than it looks like when Dante gets there in the Paradiso. Spoiler, but uh, it doesn't look quite like this. Um, uh, anyway, so um, I'm not going to do a long preamble uh, on this book, um, mostly because I'm wholly unqualified to do so. But uh, the uh, primary reason is that um, what I, I want to do, what I always prefer to do with books like this, that is books which really embody a lot of really fascinating world building, um, is just to kind of jump in and pay special attention to how we are, you know, introduced uh, to uh, this. So rather than you know, kind of lecturing about it. Um, I'd much rather um, look at the ways in which we are introduced to it. And it's one of the things that I really admire most uh, about this book, um, sort of the way in which all that is done. Um, so just a, a quick reminder before we start about the, the kind of the trajectory, the, the, the ballistic trajectory of Mythgard Academy here. Um, uh, so we're going to be discussing The Moon is a Harsh Mistress for I am not quite sure. Now, you'll notice on the web page, I've given up on reading schedules, right? Like, I just, I can't. Like, it's, I'm clearly doing more harm than good in trying, <laughs> attempting to map things out in advance. Um, we shall proceed through the book at the pace at which we proceed through the book. Um, and, um, 
uh, and I will uh, I will make sure to let you guys know how many chapters to read. We'll see how we do tonight and how far we get. Um, cool. Stephen says this will be his introduction to Heinlein. Neat. Yeah, I, I think it's a good one. This was the first Heinlein I ever read, Stephen. Um, uh, and I, 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 I found that really good. So anyway, so we're going to discuss this. But my my rough goal uh, is to um, to complete our discussion. We'll see what happens. But my goal is to complete our discussion by around the end of August um, uh, so that we can you know, we'll spend the summer uh, with Heinlein. Um, and then in the first week of September, The Nature of Middle Earth by Tolkien comes out, this new Tolkien stuff that no one's ever read before. Uh, so I'm... Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm, I, I know people are going to want to talk about that. So I think we should just talk about it together. So we're going to do that, um, starting at the beginning of September, um, not the first of September, but, uh, like the eighth, I think of September, uh, is the, is the Wednesday, first Wednesday after the book is released. Um, no point trying to do it on the first cause we won't have the book yet. So, um, anyway, cool. Um, so just to remind folks about kind of what's coming up uh, in Mythgard Academy. And don't forget uh, uh, Mythmoot registration. Don't forget to come to Mythmoot, especially since uh, if you come to Mythmoot, then you can hear Curtis give a paper on Heinlein at Mythmoot. So see, there you go. Like we, this is, uh, we're, we're just kind of the warm up act uh, for Curtis's uh, Mythmoot talk. So, uh, <laughs> so you should definitely, uh, you should definitely tune in for that. All right. Let us go straight in and start. You're going to be shocked to hear with the first paragraph. Now, no, uh, Ray, don't worry. I'm not going to go through the. <laughs> we're not going to go through the whole book paragraph by paragraph. Um, in fact, one thing that I, I wanted to explain right away, even before we start, is that another way in which I'm 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 kind of mixing things up a little bit compared to how I have been approaching the last few books that we've done. Um, I'm not just going through like the passages aren't going to be in order. I've 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 jumbled them a little bit, um, mostly because. I really wanted to kind of sort out a few different threads in these early chapters. So, um, uh, so anyway, we're, we're going to, uh, I, I, I want to focus first at the beginning. So I, I have roughly uh, sort of three different topics that I wanted to look at in these first three chapters. Uh, first, I wanted to just kind of, as I said, get a, an introduction to the moon. What do we know about this world? What's going on, you know, and how do we learn it? Um, and what, does the text primarily emphasize and what can we see about this society based on what it emphasizes and how that's the first thing I want to look at. The second thing I want to look at is, uh, uh, Manny's relationship with Mike. I want to look at, you know, Mike is, uh, uh, Mike, the computer is a huge character, uh, in this story. And I want to look at how that relationship begins. And you know, again, how we're sort of introduced to that. And then the third thing, of course, I want to look at is the, uh, you know, uh, the story of how Manny ends up accidentally, uh, joining a revolution. So we'll, we'll look at the political situation and how the revolution begins there. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Bruce says, when is the narrator writing this text? That's a really good question. I don't know, actually. I don't think we're ever told, uh, in the narrative itself, exactly when at some point after the events, um, for sure. Um, as, Bruce, I'm going to take that as a segue into our first slide, right? Uh, because, of course, look where we begin. I see in, I see in Lunaya Pravda that Luna City Council has passed on first reading a bill to examine, license, inspect, and tax public food vendors operating inside municipal pressure. I see also is to be mass meeting tonight to organize Sons of Revolution Talk Talk. My old man taught me two things mind own business, and always cut cards. Politics never tempted me. But on May 13, May, on, on Monday 13, May 2075, I was in computer room of Lunar Authority Complex, visiting with computer boss Mike, while other machines whispered among themselves. Mike was not official name. I had nicknamed him for Mycroft Holmes, in a story written by Dr. Watson before he founded IBM. This, this story character would just sit and think, and that's what Mike did. Mike was a fair dinkum thinkum, sharpest computer you'll ever meet. Okay. First, Bruce, chronology, right? Um, we do get a date right there in the beginning of the second paragraph, right? So we do get some kind of context. Like this is in the future, but we're not talking, you know, this is not like, you know, the, you know, the, 
year 4000 or something like that, right? This is, uh, you know, this was written in the 60s, so we're looking at a little more than 100 years in the future, right? The events of these are a little more than 100 years in the future. Um, uh, so, okay, okay. Um, and... Uh, uh, good. Let's see. Oh, and I can see, by the way, those of you who are in Twitch and who are not in GoToWebinar and want to be, go to MythGuard.org and you can click uh, on the link from there. But also I can see your comments on Twitch as well. So that also kind of pretty much works. But if you want to join us in GoToWebinar, uh, then uh, uh, you can click on the registration link on the MythGuard, MythGuard.org page. Um, uh, yes. Okay. So so that's the first piece of context that we get. But again, notice that's not the date, as Bruce was pointing out. That's not the date of the narration, right? This is not a sort of an immediate first person account as if we're kind of right along with him the whole time it's happening. It is clearly um, after the events. And indeed, we get spoilers right there in that first paragraph, right? Sons of Revolution. OK, so if there's a meeting of the Sons of Revolution, uh, then... Um, kind of tells us, A, what's likely to happen, and B, what the outcome was, right? Um, uh, so that's interesting. And of course, in the context of what we are going to learn about Lunar Society in 2075, the fact that there is a Lunar City Council that's passing bills, right, is uh, also a spoiler, right? Um, that they are not living in whatever time Manny is writing that first paragraph, they are not living under the same conditions that he's describing through the rest of this story. So it's very interesting to me that we're we're given this spoiler in the first paragraph. We know that there's going to be a revolution and that it's going to succeed. Um, and I think that that's a really, a really fascinating choice, a really important choice, right? There's always this kind of implicit, whenever you get a story in the first person, right? Stories in the first person by convention, contained a kind of spoiler, right? Like, uh, you know, you know, uh, another book I'm reading, rereading right now is uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, my favorite American book, uh, work of American literature. And, um, uh, you know, there's like a spoiler there too, right? Ishmael survives, <laughs> right? Because he's narrating the story, right? And so that's, we get that, right? Like we, you know, the, the, the one, the one thing that you can often, usually, uh, kind of rest in is that the first person narrator is likely to live. Not always, right? You know, sometimes that can be gotten around. Um, but, um, but usually, usually. Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so, yeah, no, Stephen says, do the United Daughters of the Confederacy spoil the ending of the Civil War? Well, that's different, though, right? Um, uh, it Again, it's one it's it's one of the things that's interesting about this is that re I didn't notice this spoiler um, when I either on my first or my second read. It was only when I went back to prep for class, basically reading it a third time that I was like, oh, well, look at that. Right. Two two pieces of evidence right there in that first paragraph that went over my head both times because it's the very first paragraph. Right. We don't like yet know enough to see the significance uh, of those things, right? Which I, I, I think is, is it makes the, it, it makes it amount kind of to foreshadowing without, um, you know, sort of revealing everything, but he's not hiding anything either, right? Suspense isn't the point of this entire thing, right? And that's clear from that first paragraph. The point is not suspense. And I like that. I actually really admire that. I think that suspense is way too overprivileged uh, by modern authors. Um, and I really admire a book which is not premised on, you know, are things going to work out or not? Um, but simply like enabling us to immerse ourselves in the story. The immersion in the world is part of the part of the pleasure, part of the experience, even more than like, but what happens and how do the characters development? Um, how do the characters develop? You know, that is to read it just for the plot or to read it just for the characters. Um, there's more to it, right? There's, this is, this is as much about kind of becoming acquainted with loony society, right? With what it means to be a loony, um, to kind of begin to understand how, 
this strange society, which whose strangeness is kind of revealed in stages here, um, really kind of functions, right? Um, and I, as I said, I really, I really like that. I really, I really uh, uh, admire that. Uh, Chris, yeah, Chris says it's it's rather like all the comments uh, by the Princess Irulan in Dune. Yes, agreed. Dune is another wonderful example of a book which is emphatically not about suspense, right? I mean, when you've got when the whole like centerpiece of it is like the dude with like prescient foresight of what's going to happen. Uh, and he's been foretelling the inevitable result for, you know, for half the book. Yeah, obviously, that's not the point. Um, but but agreed from the beginning, uh, the uh, the 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 quotations from Princess Irulan contextualize things in a different way. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, Sarah, I, I do agree. It is interesting how a lot of the spoilers pass you by. Um, it's still established. It, it like I think it still has an impact, even if you don't catch it as I missed it both times, right? Both my first two times reading. It was only the third, uh, that I, um, um, that I, um, that I really noticed things. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, Chris, I'm tempted to follow up there, but I don't want to go down a whole Dune rabbit trail, uh, there. Um, yeah, good. Now, okay, uh, Marie was saying that getting used to the language couches the spoiling slightly uh, uh, in a in a first time reading. Yes, uh, the the orientation that's required um, to adjust to the language, right, is really. Um, I agree. That's the my first experience with this. Now. Um, I every time I've read this, uh, I've read it uh, uh, in audiobooks. So um, you know you're getting a, a voice actor delivering the lines, who I think does a really good job. By the way, um, um, what I really like about the audio, uh, I'm, I'm reading to the, I'm, I'm reading the Audible uh, version of it, and um, what I really like about the actor's performance is that the you know he makes Manny's accent sound vaguely Russian, but it's not a Russian accent, right? Um, it's probably more Russian than anything else, but it's not a pure Russian accent. And at first I thought, and Stephen, I remember you had this same sort of reaction, um, uh, that, uh, that it just kind of sounded like a poor Russian accent, right? Um, and that was my first reaction too. I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess this character is Russian or of Russian extraction, right? But, you know, this is not the best Russian accent I've ever heard. Right. And it was only, of course, as I, you know, by the time I got into like chapter three that I was like, oh, right. OK, it's not it's, it's not it's not meant to be right. This is a loony accent. Um, and uh, it is like he is the the very dialect and word choice of the narration is pointing us is pointing us to what loony society is. Right. Uh, and how this works. Um, so I think it's. um I think it's pretty interesting, um, uh, actually, the way that that goes. And also, Arthur, as you uh, remind us, um, this was written in the Cold War, so the uh, kind of the the the, the Russian um, flavor, right, of this. Again, it's not exactly Russian, but there's a distinctly Russian flavor. Um, Russian is, I think, one of the clearly one of the strongest flavors uh, there uh, on the moon, um, culturally speaking, uh, is a, a very interesting choice in the 60s, right? Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, Stephen, it rem uh, uh, Stephen Keene, it reminded me a lot about of, of uh, Firefly. I was thinking about Firefly a lot, actually. Um, and uh, Curtis, it's like the ideal... <laughs> topic for you right let's let's talk about joss whedon and heinlein right um i think it would be fascinating and uh, Stephen, it's one of the things like uh I, w I was i was i was thinking about that actually like if i were if i were writing a paper if i were going to write a myth mood paper uh on this book i would be really tempted Stephen, to do a, a comparison and contrast of the sort of dialect of uh, of the loonies uh, in the moon is a harsh mistress, and the dialect uh, of especially uh, uh, Captain Mao in Firefly. Um, but I think that it's, I think that it's very very interesting. Um, so any, but but I'm we're, I'm not going to talk about that too much because again, this isn't about Firefly. Um, that would be interesting, 
to talk about Firefly sometime. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, uh, Bruce, I agree. Uh, the 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 thing about Dr. Watson, right, in a story written by Dr. Watson before he founded IBM. Uh, Stephen Cover, you were asking before, um, is that a jo- is he joking or a, is that a joke or is it an actual piece of historical misinformation? Um, well, that's the fascinating thing is that that happens in paragraph two, right? So we have almost no context in which to decide that, like, is this narrator the kind of person who's likely to make that sort of joke, right? Is this, is that, is that how he rolls? Um, Or is it rather a sign of like, this is in the future and like, he's just confused, right? Um, Because of course there's several layers of confusion, right? Dr. Watson, not, not actually the author of the story, right, about Sherlock Holmes. Um, That's part of the fiction, right? Uh, It's like he's forgotten about Doyle entirely, and not to mention, of course, that it's not exactly the same Dr. Watson who founded IBM. Um, On the whole, right, on the whole, I think that... um, uh, oh, yeah, no, Stephen, exactly. I'm also sure that Heinlein meant that it's a joke. Uh, Exactly. The question is whether Manny does, again. And I think... On the whole, I incline to uh, no. I, I I think I I would I would guess mistake rather than joke. Um, but I only, again I, we don't have the data for that in the first um, uh, in on the first page, right? And so, isn't it kind of interesting that one of the very first things that we find ourselves doing as we're reading the story is saying, "Wait, was that a joke? Was that supposed to be funny?" And of course, that's exactly what Mike and Manny are going to end up talking about, right? The nature of humor and what is funny and what is not funny as the computer tries to figure it out, right? And here we are, alien to this world, <clears throat> kind of in a parallel position to Mike, right? Try to say, you know, is that funny, man? Uh, is it kind of exactly what I'm wanting to ask uh, Manny there? Um uh, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Stephen, I agree. This is a funny once. No question. Um, <laughs> no question. Yeah, exactly. Silk Westcott is wondering how he had time, how that guy had time to found IBM, write the Sherlock Holmes books and discover DNA all at the same time. I know that guy had quite a career. I agree. Dr. Watson. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. More, uh, just a little bit more. Okay. By the way. I'm not going to spend this much time on every slide. I want to make sure that's clear from the beginning. But again, this is the first slide. This is important. Okay. Um, more about the language. What just what what other observations that you guys had about the dialect, right? Um, uh, one of you was um, uh, pointing out, uh, Devorah, you were uh, talking about clipped language, right? It is very clipped, isn't it? Um, and, um, yeah, yeah, it, 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 that's definitely one of the features of it. Um, I, it was a, an interesting comment. Um, uh, so there were, several, there were several people and it's, it was actually, uh, uh, Kurt, Curtis wrote the description of the course, uh, you know, of this, of this, uh, discussion on the, uh, Mythgard page. Um, and he wrote it in, I thought, a very admirable uh, imitation of uh, of Manny's dialect. Um, but I had several people <laughs> emailing me saying, um, did you proofread that? Because there's a lot of mistakes <laughs> in, that, in that page. And I actually, like, preemptively, as soon as I read it, like, I felt myself twitch when I saw the first missing article. And it wasn't until the second sentence that I'm like, oh, OK, all right, right. Oh, I get it. I get it. But I got it fairly quickly because I'd just been listening to the audiobook, So it was it was in my head, like the rhythm of it was in my head. Um, and um <laughs> so I, uh, I, 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 so I, but I, I immediately like talk to our, you know, website people and I'm like, don't proofread, don't, it's supposed to be this way, don't proofread. And I had several people emailing me like, you know, oh gosh, um, which was a really fun experiment, right? Um, to kind of see how, you know, like to, to, to just kind of see the response to this, right? And the, the response was like, this is, these are mistakes, right? This is, uh, you know, one of the one of the one of the uh, the guys who wrote me was joking and saying it sounded like this was written by 
uh, you know, somebody who doesn't really know English very well, right? Um, uh, you know, he's saying this, in, 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 this is somebody who uh, is a native English speaker who is uh, living abroad and saying, actually, this sounds exactly like something that many of the, many of the folks around me would have written uh, in English. It's exactly a very similar kind of mistakes uh, that they often make. Um, so um, uh, anyway, I think that, um, uh, I think that we, that's one effect that I think that it has, right? It does sound like the first impression, I think, that it leaves is of somebody who is not really fluent in English, right? This sounds like somebody attempting English who is not really comfortable in English, right? Or somebody who is mentally translating from a language which just doesn't work exactly uh, like English does. Uh, the kinds of mistakes, right? One is inclined to call it at first, or rather, let's say more neutrally, the kinds of variations that we see uh, in this dialect compared to standard English. Um, and we see people who do speak standard English, right? Um, uh, even loonies who speak standard English. Um, the primary differences are like the differences of one who does not really understand how English works, right? Somebody who only uh, is has, you know, an advanced proficiency, but not really mastery uh, of English. Um, and so therefore it it's it creates, I think, a really interesting effect. It might be tempting, right, for us. If we're honest with ourselves to feel a little bit superior, right? Like we're probably smarter than this person, right? I mean, come on, there's there's a little bit of that effect, right? Even you might not want to admit it, right? But but there is that kind of like, you know, oh, this is, you know, this, that impulse to um, a sense of superiority, right? Oh, this person just does not know how to use English the way that I do, right? Uh, I mean, I that's, I think, a fascinating um, uh, move, at the beginning. And it changes, of course, right? As we get to know Manny more and as we come to understand more and more um, why it is he talks like this. And one of the things that I'm going to be interested to see as we move forward, one of the questions I hope to return to off and on, um, is why is it that Manny's language is different from other people's language? Not even just different from some of the other characters, but even from his own family members uh, at times. What, what, what do we see? What, what, what do we come to understand about, uh, about Manny's dialect? Um, but um, anyway, yeah. Um, Good. Right. Yeah. Marie says, immediately my mind wants to figure out the distinctions between a talk and a talk talk. Um, yes. Now, see, thanks, Marie, for pointing that one out. There are two phrases that I want to hit on and then I'm totally done with this slide. Um, one is talk talk. Um, it is, I th think, yes, the most um, unusual piece of vocabulary in that whole first paragraph. Right. And it's the very last word or phrase. I guess it's a word. It's a hyphenated word um, in the paragraph. Right. So we get this, you know, passed on first reading a bill to examine, license, inspect and tax public food vendors operating inside municipal pressure. Um, OK. Right. So we're uh, kind of. It sounds like slightly garbled English, but but esoteric in some ways, right? Not this is not simplistic, right? Um, and then we end with to organize sons of revolution talk talk, um, talk talk being an obviously alien word and inviting Marie exactly that kind of thing. Like okay, so talk talk. But I find when I think about talk talk uh, for a second, it's um, uh, it seems very simply descriptive. Um, that is, I think, Marie, the difference between a talk and a talk talk is that in a talk talk, a talk talk is a two-way or multi-way discussion, right? Whereas if you're just, a talk would just be listening 
to someone speak or give a lecture, right? Um, but a talk talk is where you all get together to discuss together. There's talk going both ways, right? Uh, going kind of back and forth. Um, yes. And, and uh, as Curtis says, according to uh, Manny's um, general attitude appears to be that talk talk means more talk than is necessary. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think so. Um, and James, I agree. Uh, as Curtis, uh, uh, pointing in a similar direction to Curtis there, um, that um, it sounds kind of cynical, right? Um, that it also does seem to imply just like talk, 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 right? Just uh, uh, mere re the mere redundancy of talking. Um, now, I don't think that that is the entire, the essence of the, like, I don't think that that is the denotation of talk, of the phrase talk, talk, that it is only a phrase used sort of scornfully um, because people seem to use it in other places in the book when they don't mean it scornfully at all. Um, it seems to be, in loony vocabulary, a perfectly neutral term. But I agree that uh, Manny himself seems to use it rather sardonically, um, and it does kind of invite that um, that sort of uh, that sort of reading. Um, um, yeah, I agree, uh, Michael. It suggests a, a lengthy discourse, right? It um, it goes on so long you have to mention it twice, as you say. The other thing, the other phrase I, I wanted to make sure we mentioned before we move on is dinkum thinkum. Um, and what is interesting to me is that I have almost no way of understanding that phrase. Um, thinkum, I think I can understand, right? I mean, we're talking about a computer, so thinkum is a noun, uh, clearly. Um, Mike was a fair... Think em. I'll skip dinkum for now, right? Uh, Mike was a fair think em. Sharpest computer you'll ever meet. Sharpest com computer you'll ever meet sounds like an appositive uh, modifying think em. And so therefore, and that, you know, as a, a computer is a thinking machine. So think em, I'm guessing from context means computer or something in that direction, right? But dinkum. I have no idea. It rhymes, right? So dinkum thinkum is a fun phrase, but is that, is it designed specifically to modify thinkum? Is it a subcategory of a thinkum? Is it just, is dinkum a general adjective that can be applied to other things? No, we'll see that before the end of, of chapter three. And it turns out to be, that turns out to be the case, right? Um, it's a, it's a, a general adjective, but that itself is really interesting, right? It's like a, it's like a general adjective, but it seems like it's manifest destiny to modify the word thinkum, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, a, a, a fairer dinkum, uh, right. Yes. That's, um, Australian slang, right? Right. Um, yes. Which points to, and it's one of many examples that we see of, um, uh, the kind of hod the cultural hodgepodge, right, that we see uh, on the moon. Um, yeah, right. Means really good. Right, right. Um, so does it go the other way around then? That is, does thinkum come from dinkum? Did dinkum come first, right? Um, and thinkum was. A, a noun that's invented essentially uh, or adapted uh, for computers. Exec, Stephen, you were just thinking exactly the same thing that I was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I agree that think is the neologism. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but, um, and that's the one we're given context for there. Right. Okay. Let's keep going. But I knew more about all these than a specialist knows. I'm general specialist. Could relieve a cook and keep orders coming, or field repair your suit and get you back to airlock still breathing. Machines like me, and I have something specialists don't have. My left arm. You see, from elbow down I don't have one. So I have a dozen left arms, each specialized, plus one that feels and looks like flesh. With proper left arm, number three, and stereo, stereo loop, 
spec I don't know how to say that. Uh, spectacles. I could make ultra micro miniature repairs that would save unhooking something and sending it Earthside to factory. For number three, it has micro manipulators as fine as those used by neurosurgeons. So they sent for me to find out why Mike wanted to give away 10 million billion authority script dollars and fix it before Mike overpaid somebody a mere 10,000. Okay, now, what do we learn? Um, uh, what do we learn in uh, in in this section about Manny? I, of course, we learn some mechanical things, right? Like the, about his artificial arms uh, uh, and the fact that he, um, on the one hand, he seems to have lost his arm um, from elbow down. Uh, he doesn't have an arm, uh, right? But he seems quite cheerful, right? About uh, his many other arms. And he has clearly, we learn about his character here, both from his attitude and from his resourcefulness, right? This is somebody who has clearly done a good deal more than just make the best of a bad situation, right? This is somebody who has taken what seems, as far as we can tell, and will turn out to be confirmed a little bit later, uh, to have been, uh, you know, a horrible accident, right? You know, he got his arm uh, uh, severed by a laser drill, right, uh, in a mining accident. Um, so, you know, there's this 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 terrible blow um, that left him crippled and disabled him from the uh, the the work that he did. And instead of, you know, uh, things going downhill uh, from there, he not only uh, recovered, but used that to both to become a computer man. Right. And not only that, uh, but to turn his dismemberment uh, into an advantage. Right. By developing all of his uh, uh, all of his uh, prosthetic arms that enable him uh, to do all of these things. And, and uh, the the abilities of Manny's left arms. Uh, right. Are going to um, uh, are, are going to be fairly prominent uh, in the plot of the story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, Devorah, definitely resilience. Definitely. Um, okay. So stereo loop spectacles, right. Are, uh, are, are for like a jeweler's tool for examining fine detail. Right. Um, loop. Is that how is it pronounced loop? It's one syllable. That's, that's the main thing that I'm, that I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, and Michael there, I think, uh, Michael saying that general specialist is, uh, is, is just funny. I, there, I think Manny's making a joke. I know more about all these than a specialist knows. I'm general specialist. That I think is that, that I think he means to be funny. I'm not convinced he's deliberately making a joke about Doctor Watson. Um, I think there that instead what we're getting is a that he has familiarity uh, with the Sherlock Holmes stories. But I mean, how many um, how many? books like that do they have access to does he have access to um that his 20th century history and 19th century literature are somewhat garbled um certainly seems not surprising given the state of how he described his education right um he he he's general specialist right uh he knows a lot of things but he he doesn't have the full story on all of these things um yeah yeah um good arthur i agree um that um, uh, I agree that um, the the parallel, right? That like we get Manny, who is himself part machine, who has made himself part machine, um, here connecting with the machine who is uh, who has come alive, right? The, the kind of links between Manny, the uh, parallel or almost anti, it's like the two of them are, are kind of meeting, right? Um, between pure man and pure machine. And they're kind of the, you know, the two of them, uh, sitting together in this room, uh, as it were, um, are kind of meeting in the middle in some sense, uh, him with his, um, you know, his, his, uh, consciousness, his, his, uh, you know, I don't want to call it human-like consciousness because it's not exactly human-like consciousness. Um, but anyway, um, you know, him becoming in some senses more and more like humans uh, and uh, Manny cheerfully, right, uh, becoming more and more like machines. And also his phrasing, machines like me, and I have something specialists don't have, right? Machines like me. 
this is something that he prides himself on and um, something that he uh, is um, uh, just it reveals something about his whole perspective and attitude. Right. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, Marie, that's a really good observation that adaptability to the requirements of the society uh, isn't him personally. Um, the flesh arm is not the first one that he mentions. Right. I don't remember which one. That's the one he calls his social arm later on, I think. Right. Um, does he ever say what number that one is? I don't I think he just calls it social arm. I don't think it's numbered. Uh, the f the fleshy arm. I don't I might be misremembering that, but. um. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. OK, but then to Mike's joke, well, we'll come back to Mike's joke about giving away 10 million billion authority script dollars uh, in a little bit. <clears throat> More about uh, Lunar Heritage. He did that first week in May, and I had to troubleshoot. I was a private contractor, not on authorities' payroll. You see, or perhaps not, times have changed. Back in bad old days, many a con served his time, then went on working for authority in the same job, happy to draw wages. But I was born free. Makes difference. My one grandfather was shipped up from Joburg for armed violence and no work permit. Other got transported for subversive activity after wet firecracker war. That's the Cold War, I believe, is the wet firecracker war, as he refers to it consistently throughout the book. Uh, maternal grandmother claimed she came up in brideship, but I've seen records. She was Peace Corps enrollee, involuntary, which means what you think. Juvenile delinquency, female type. As she was in early clan marriage, stone gang, and shared six husbands with another woman, identity of maternal grandfather opened a question. But was often so, and I'm content with grandpappy she picked. My old man claimed he had even longer distinguished line. Ancestress hanged in Salem for witchcraft, and a g-g-g-great grandfather broken on wheel for piracy. Another ancestress in first shipload to Botany Bay. Okay, what do we learn about... Um, uh, what do we learn about, about Manny and what do we learn about lunar society in his reflections here on his heritage? He was born free, right? So many a con served his time, right? So prison. Okay. So we are, cause he doesn't explain on the very first page that the moon was a penal colony originally, right? This is one of the first places. I don't think it's necessarily the very first reference, but it's one of the first places where it is made more clear that the moon was, the purpose of the lunar colony was as a penal colony um, when he talks about cons serving their time. Um, but I was born free. Now, my initial impulse when I, when, I, when I hear just that part, right, is that Manny's trying to separate himself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the people who live here on the moon are cons, are ex-cons. I'm different, right? I'm not like them. I was born free. Um, like he's going to distance himself uh, from these kinds of people. But then, no, he doesn't, right? He talks about how all of his ancestors were criminals, right? All of his ancestors were shipped up to the moon uh, uh, for different crimes. Armed violence and no work permit. I, I love the balance there. Armed violence and no work permit. Uh, like, what, if he'd had a work permit, the armed violence would have been fine. Um, uh, uh, subversive activity, um, juvenile delinquency, female type. Um, so... And he's actively proud of that, right? Um, he is proud of his family divorce, as you say, even though he can't really be sure of all the facts. Um, not only that, he, he hunts back in his line, right? I mean, he, he like digs back, um, you know, not to find like, uh, you know, my... Uh, you know, my many times great grandfather fought at the Battle of Hastings or something like that, right? What does he trace back? Um, that he is an ancestress hanged in Salem for witchcraft, uh, that one of his ancestors was broken on the wheel for piracy. Um, uh, and, you know, spoiler, the next paragraph begins, 
proud of my ancestry, right? You know, he, he he's clearly proud of his ancestry. We can see it all the way through, right? So his emphasis then, going back to that first paragraph, but I was born free, is not to distinguish himself, not at all to distinguish himself from the other loonies who are cons or ex-cons. Um, either they themselves were shipped up, right, and have done their time, or they're still doing their time, that they're here because they are doing their time. Um, uh, he, he's not distancing himself from that at all. He does not seem to care at all. Um, but um, but he is um, making a distinction. But I was born free. And he says, makes difference. What difference exactly does it make? Um, and that's, he doesn't say here. What he goes on to say after he says makes difference doesn't exactly explain, at least I don't see, um, where this constitutes the difference between his position and the position of a Khan who has served his time and goes on to work for the authority in the same job. Um, uh, it makes a difference in the sense that he was never obligated to work for the authority. Right. From day because he was born free from day one, he has been able to choose what he did. Right. He was never bound to the authority. Um, capital A authority. Right. Um, and uh, by the way, this is one of a few examples where I find the lack of definite articles particularly interesting, where I begin to wonder or suspect that perhaps the variation in the dialect is not simply a product of a lack of proficiency in English, right? Um, we would say not on the authority's payroll, right? He says not on authority's payroll, working for authority in the same job, right? There's a difference between those two things. When you lose the definite article, it doesn't make it quite insulting, but the the, right, giving giving the authority their the, right, their definite article, um, that's, that's a little bit of emphasis, right? They are the authority, right? They're just authority. That's their, that's just a proper noun. It's what they call themselves, right? And it's the reality too. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's one of the places where it begins to, um, we begin to see, uh, I think, anyway, perhaps suspect a pattern there that what is being expressed, that it's not that Manny is somebody who has not yet come to the full mastery of English, but rather he is speaking the dialect of a people, these multi-generational loonies, right? People who have, because he is the product of, not of a particular linguistic milieu from the earth, Right. He is the product of several generations living uh, on the moon. Right. So I tend there, especially after this passage, tend to be thinking more and more that the peculiarities of Manny's dialect are expressing lunar culture in uh, a, a really visceral way. Right. In a visceral way. And that. I begin to feel, by the time I get towards the middle or end of the book, I begin to feel that the people who speak in proper English are just not quite as in touch with the culture of Luna, right? They don't, they're not, th even, even, even Prof, right, who is going to be a, a highly respected character all the way through. We'll meet Prof briefly, but we won't talk about him too much today. Um, but um, even Prof, who speaks in very polished and formal and even archaic English, um, he's not native. He was, uh, he was uh, 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 not elderly, but he was an um, advanced adult when he was transported. Um, he was middle-aged already. Um, and although, of course, he is, has earned uh, the uh, almost universal respect of the people of Luna, he's not exactly one of them. Not like Manny is, right? He is not immersed all the way through. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, um, Mudmore, that's a really good way of saying it. Um, by t leaving out the the in front of authority, it almost makes it sound like authority is being put in air quotes. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's not 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 quite that strong, but yeah, that that's exactly the kind of direction I was I was thinking. Um, uh, now, Chris, you're right that um, there are other elements too, right? There seems to be a kind of efficiency uh, in the in the in the talk of of you know loonies when they're really speaking to each other, right? Uh, in the way that we will see a few times. Um, Chris says, it is, you know, fewer words, less oxygen expended, right? I mean, uh, air, is, uh, air is precious, right? Uh, it's another reason to be a little bit cynical about talk talk, uh, right? But um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so it's one of the things that I, I'll, I'll be interested to hear observations that any of you have along the way as we can begin to see more of these kind of like more of these effects. Like what, what um, this is going to be a cumulative thing as we go through, but it's a it's a it's a thread I don't want to lose. What do we learn about lunar society? Because um, I think there are some things that we can only learn about lunar society by perceiving the patterns in the language that Manny uses. Um, okay. Now, obviously, we've got some other differences. Um, uh, as she was in early clan marriage and shared six husbands with another woman, identity of maternal grandfather opened to question. Okay. So marriage conventions are apparently different. Um, okay. We're prepared for that, though we don't know exactly what clan marriage means. Uh, he tosses out that category as if we did know, but we don't. Um, um, the phrasing is interesting already, right? Shared six husbands with another woman, right? This is definitely not uh, a woman who was shared around by six men, right? That's one distinction that we're Definitely. And we see that reinforced in the next sentence. Right. But was often so. And I'm content with grandpappy. She picked. She picked. Right. So the choice being hers. Um, again, we get in those two sentences just a glimpse of the role of women in this society. Right. It's only a hint uh, so far. Um, even his own attitude. I'm content with grandpappy. Even he is submitting to her choice, right? As apparently um, the men involved also did. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, other thing. Um, let's see. Uh, I was going to... There's one other thing I wanted to... Oh, yeah. Sorry. One other, one other comment I wanted to... I forget who said this first. Um, but um, it is... Um, uh, it's really, it is interesting that all of the like ethnic origins that he refers to when he's talking about his ancestors, um, no Russians among, among them, right? Uh, uh, mostly European. Um, ancestress from Salem, um, a pirate, and so probably North American European. Um, uh, um, first ship to Botany Bay in Australia. Um, uh, we've got um, the Wet Firecracker War. Well, it's possible that he was got transported. He might have been Russian, right? Could have been on the other side of the Wet Firecracker War. Um, we got the uh, shipped up from Joburg, which I, I agree, Michael, is presumably Johannesburg. Um, Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I agree, Silk Westit, Westcott. He seems to have been raised closest uh, 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 to Novi Len, right? Uh, Novi Leningrad. Um, yeah. So is that part of what influences it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Okay proud of my ancestry, and while I did business with Warden, would never go on his payroll. Perhaps distinction seems trivial, since I was Mike's valet from day he was unpacked, but mattered to me. I could down tools and tell them to go to hell. 
Besides, private contractor paid more than civil service rating with authority. Computer men scarce. How many loonies could go earthside and stay out of hospital long enough for computer school, even if didn't die? I'll name one. Me. Had been down twice. Once three months, once four, and got schooling. But meant harsh training, exercising in centrifuge, wearing weights even in bed. Then I took no chances on Terra. Never hurried, never climbed stairs, nothing that could strain heart. Women? Didn't even think about women. In that gravitational field it was no effort not to. But most loonies never tried to leave the rock. Too risky for any bloke who'd been in Luna more than weeks. Computer men sent up to install Mike were on short-term bonus contracts. Get job done fast before irreversible physiological change marooned them 400,000 kilometers from home. Okay, so first, what again, what we learn about uh, Manny, and again, this is where we see him uh, uh, beginning his second career, right? Again, presumably after his accident. Um, and again, we see him not only that not only we now learn that not only did he reinvent himself and indeed partially rebuild himself physically, um, but we see that he, in fact, did so uh, uh, against significant odds, right? Uh, facing and overcoming. Um, extreme hardships, which nobody else that he knows on Looney, uh, on the on on the moon rather on Luna had ever done, right? Um, going down Earthside for computer school, right? So of course now there are several other things that we learn here too, right? As also implied by the fact that only with his number three arm is he able to make repairs that prevent them having to send it down to the factory. We can see the technological limitations on the moon. Right. It's not that their technology is, uh, you know, like behind the earth or something. They just don't have the resources. Right. There, there are things that they just can't do. Um, and if they are faced with certain, you know, high level repairs or something like that, they've got to ship the thing all the way back down to earth to get it fixed. Right. So we can see that there is a certain lack of privilege or at least lack of resources in the moon. Similarly, there's no schooling. Right. Nothing like you have to go Earthside in order to become a computer man. Um, he couldn't get that kind of training uh, on Luna. Um, and yeah, good, Stephen, we learned that Luna and Terra are in communication also um, even more basically. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but there's not significant travel of people between the two, except one way for undesirables. Right. Um, the idea that the rock, as it's called, which, of course, makes me think of Alcatraz, especially in the prison context, right? Um, and that's, again, kind of delightful. It's almost like, again, it makes me wonder if this is another um, historical illusion on his part, right? Like he's heard that there's a famous prison called The Rock, and he always assumed that they were referring to the moon uh, when, they, when, they, when they referred to The Rock. Um, I think that's... Uh, I think that's... That seems likely, right? That he's making another Doctor Watson slip there, um, but again, but it's interesting and kind of revealing. Um, trip to the moon is a one-way trip, not just for cons, but for anybody, right? Um, it is a permanent exile, Arthur. That's exactly that's exactly it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, oh, I agree, uh, Stephen Keene. It is really admirable how Heinlein weaves so much exposition into uh, a single scene, his visit with Mike about the joke. Yes, yes. I mean, it's the first chapter of a book like this is really difficult, really difficult to do well. How do you, that's why I'm always so interested in this. How do you succeed in explaining about the world without just lecturing about it, right? Without making it boring, without, um, or without making it too um, uh, strained, you know? Um, like the whole, like, I'm going to work the exposition into dialogue, right? Which uh, so often doesn't work well. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so what was I going to say next? I forget. His attitude towards Warden, right? Again, not the Warden, right? Warden. While I did business with Warden, uh, would never go on his payroll. Um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, mattered to me. I could down tools and tell them to, and tell them go to hell. Um, I, I'm trying to. Sometimes you will probably catch me adding in particles where they're not in the original text. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to be faithful in my uh, reading it aloud. Uh, but um, uh, but it's hard, and I will sometimes make mistakes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I agree, uh, Stephen Cover. It does make Warden sound like a name instead of a title. Um, yeah, it does in that way kind of lessen his authority. Of course, it's also interesting uh, that uh, Mort the Wart is the their nickname for the current Warden, right? Uh, and that Wart rhymes with Warden, right? It's almost like the two are <laughs> the, the two are near synonyms, uh, right? Uh, uh, warden and Wart. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so we can see his attitude, um, even notice also not only his clear attitude towards authority and warden, but even his more subtly expressed attitude towards Terra, right? You know, when he says, I took no chances on Terra, yeah, it's about the gravity, right? He, he, he could do himself harm. You know, he's, you know, he... Heinlein here introduces uh, here for the first time this really important concept of these permanent physiological changes and how difficult it is for anyone who becomes acclimated to Luna to go to Terra, to survive in Terra. Um, Terra is a hostile environment. Um, just being there can kill you. Um, and but it seems to go beyond the mere danger of it, right? Um, he, it's harsh training, right? Harsh training in order to do it. Um, uh, most loonies never tried to leave the, <clears throat> the rock. Too risky. Too risky. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see, Arthur, I think, I don't remember. Maybe I'll have a passage on when Mort the Wart is used for the first time. It might be after the fight at the Talk Talk in Chapter 2, um, but it's not way after the revolution begins. I, I, I know it happens in the first three chapters, the introduction to Mort the Wart. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, okay. Um, so yes, this general attitude, but again, notice how already in establishing this sort of scientific framework, right, the gravitational issue, um, notice the immediate cultural impact that that has, right, the immediate quasi-allegorical overlay that it has in the context of what is what Manny clearly views as an oppressive regime back in the bad old days, as he says, right? Um, that and look at the way that it colors <clears throat> the entire relationship between Terra and Luna, right? Um, when you go to Luna, if you get acclimated, if you visit for more than a couple weeks, you will get acclimated to Luna. You'll become a loony, whether you like it or not. L like being a loony is infectious, right? And once you're a loony, you're unsuited for Earth ever again, right? Once you go to Luna, you 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 can't go back. It's a one-way trip, one-way trip in the sense that it's a prison, you know, prison for life. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, it gets, in hearing his descriptions of going to Earth, it gets this positive over it. It's not just a, a doom, right? It's not just a, it's not only a prison sentence. Um in fact, in his experience, it's like the other way around, right? The entire climate, the entire nature of Earth and Terran society is inimical to loonies, right? Is damaging to them. Uh, you will be not corrupted. You'll be destroyed just by going there. Um, it's, um, it's really interesting. So it is permanent... Um, it is permanent exile, but 
but that's not how they talk about it. Um, if I could be forgiven a brief Tolkien illusion here. Um, it's like how the early Numenorians always refer to themselves as exiles, right? Um, you know, Boromir at the Council of Elrond uh, might be very full of the idea of the glory of Gondor, right? But that's not how Elendil thought about it, right? Or Isildur, or any of them. They established these cities and they established these realms in exile, by which they meant the places where we have to squat now that our true home is gone and we can never recover it again. The place where we can sit and attempt to console ourselves in this pale imitation in exile. The emphasis is always on that which was and that which has been lost and that everything else is only just a pale imitation, right? And I bring this up in order to emphasize the vast contrast here, right? Is it a permanent exile? Yeah, it's a permanent exile, but that's not how they talk about it. Right? Certainly not how many, it's worlds away from how Manny talks about it, right? It's almost the opposite of how Manny talks about it. Um, uh, going to Terra is, um, uh, going to Terra is, is, it's just, it's, it's horrible. No one would even want to try, right? Um, yes, do you, if you, when you go to Luna, do you lose your homeland? Yeah, but you, but you haven't lost you have gained right you 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 become a loony and you can't ever go back like your body doesn't even want to go back and you don't even want to go back anymore right um there is no pining for tara um now Alyssa, that is a wonderful observation um uh notice how uh, Alyssa points out notice how he talks about being on tara but in Luna, then I took no chances on Terra. Uh, too risky for any bloke who'd been in Luna more than weeks. What do we learn from that? Do you see what we learn? Very subtly, what we learn there. And there's some really interesting irony here as well. Um... Yeah, that everyone on Luna lives underground. They, 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 they all live under the surface. Um, you live in Luna. You don't live on Luna. Nobody lives on the surface. You live in Luna. Um, it's an indoors kind of place. There's no atmosphere on the moon, right? Uh, so you don't, you don't, str I mean, you can go outside in your pea suit, but you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky thing to do, um, but um, uh, but of course on Terra they just they live, uh, they just live on the ground, right? It's it's very different. And 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 notice the irony. What do they call people who have the loonies? What's their what's their slang for citizen of Earth? What do they call them? You remember? Earthworms. Yeah, earthworms. I'm going to do this earthworm style, uh, right? Um, they call them earthworms, which is really funny, right? Because they don't <laughs> tunnel in, in the earth. Um, and it's not why they call them that. But, uh, uh, but I, 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 think that's, I think that's really funny. Um, okay, more. Let's keep learning more. My grandfather Stone claimed that Luna was only open prison in history. No bars, no guards, no rules, and no need for them. Back in early days, he said, before it was clear that transportation was a life sentence, some lags tried to escape. By ship, of course. And since a ship is mass rated almost to a gram, that meant a ship's officer had to be bribed. Some were bribed, they say, but were no escapes. Man who takes bribe doesn't necessarily stay bribed. I recall seeing a man just after eliminated through East Lock. Don't suppose a corpse eliminated in orbit looks prettier. So wardens didn't fret about protest meetings. Let them yap was policy. Yapping had same significance as squeals of kittens in a box. Oh, some wardens listened and other wardens tried to suppress it, but added up same either way. No program. Okay. Um, so we can see, of course, not only what he tells us <clears throat> about the wardens' attitudes uh, to 
the people, right, and uh, the people attempting to rally and talking and having talk talk, right, among themselves. Um, but also, again, I think we can see Manny's attitude as well, right? When he says yapping had same significance as squeals of kittens in a box, um, notice, by the way, that he uses indefinite articles, but not definite articles, right? We don't get these, but we do get A's, right? The kittens in a box. Um, and we had another indefinite article. I recall seeing a man just after eliminated. Yes, yes. Um, don't suppose a corpse eliminated in orbit looks prettier. So indefinite articles we do, but not definite articles. Um, yeah, so... Um, Anyway, I, I would suggest it sounds like Manny doesn't think the yapping has much more significance than squeals of kittens in a box either. Um, he seems to have a certain amount of scorn uh, for the yapping himself. Um, I don't get the sense of a sense of solidarity there, that he's uh, characterizing the warden's attitude in a way that's, you know, supposed to make us outraged. I don't think he feels outraged by this. Um, um, it is because it's his assessment, no program, right? And that is, on the one hand, his assessment of the warden's attitude. But I think by the end of that paragraph, he's clearly expressing his attitude, no program. It doesn't operate, right? This is a program, this, uh, um, it's, uh, um, it won't compile, right? I mean, this is this 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 is code that won't compile. It just it it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good. As Stephen King uh, Keen says, the uh, the no program thing. Manny thinks like a computer. Mike thinks like a human. Maybe that's why machines like him. Yes, Manny does think like a computer, right? And uses expressions like that. You know, uh, what, like what 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 else does he say? Like uh, uh, roll back to zero, right? Um, uh, you know, go back to the first line of the code and start again. Let's just start start the program again. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we see embedded in this, right? He speaks. He thinks he does think like a, a computer. He does kind of speak the computer's languages. Right. Um, even that image that we got in that, uh, I think, in that second paragraph of the whole book. Um, remember his uh, his characterization of the other of the other computers whispering to each other, right? Um, not just making random noises. They were whispering, but they were only whispering to each other. They weren't uh, they weren't actually talking to him the way that Mike does. Um, good, yeah. David Atley was thinking uh, something very similar, um, and I wonder, Mike. Um, sorry, David, in your comment about Mike, um, about um, how much there is. Um, how much these the, the the two things, which comes first, right? Him adjusting to Mike or Mike adjusting to him. But again, the image that I get is of the two of them meeting in the middle, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize, though, um, Ed, and uh, you were right on this, um, Arthur. In Luna, life has less value could die at any point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I recall seeing a man just after eliminated through East Lock. Just after eliminated. So he saw somebody thrown out into the vacuum, right? Don't suppose a corpse eliminated in orbit looks prettier. Um, he's commenting on how, you know, unappealing the corpse of the dude looked, right? Um, but he doesn't suggest that this is a particularly unusual or particular scar particularly scarring experience. Um, um, nor do we know anything about the circumstances. He does not seem to be describing an accident, right? This dude was eliminated through the East Lock, right? He is the, he is the object of a transitive verb, right? This was done to him. Um, this is not something that just happened. Um, this is not an accident. We'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, uh, but um, uh, but but yeah, he's relatively again. He's not like delighted, right? Um, he doesn't speak glowingly about this. He's saying it was repulsive, but um, uh, 
but but also he's pretty matter of fact about it um yeah <laughs> yeah Stephen. i wonder Stephen says uh manny's not altogether on anyone's side uh because no one is altogether on his side well with one exception Stephen. right there's only one person who is altogether on manny's side right and that's mike mike uh is the one who under who understands him right um yeah yeah okay let's keep going um we can see the same theme being picked up when he tries to get into the protest meeting nobody he growled gets in without being vouched for who are you i am i answered carefully manuel garcia o'kelly and old cobbers all know me who are you never mind Show a ticket with right chop or out you go. I wondered about his life expectancy. Tourists often remark on how polite everybody is in Luna, with understated comment that ex-prison shouldn't be so civilized. Having been earthside and seen what they put up with, I know what they mean. But useless to tell them that we are what we are because bad actors don't live long in Luna. But had no intention of fighting, no matter how neutral this lad behaved. I simply thought about how his face would look if I brushed number seven arm across his mouth. I don't know what the number seven arm is. I have to assume it's a fairly heavy one uh, under the circumstances. I wondered about his life expectancy, uh, he says. Um, it seems to be pretty normal. Why is everybody so civilized <laughs> on Luna? Um, uh, because uh, um, bad actors don't live long. Um, that's... Um, pretty clear, right? Um, he is not himself contemplating killing this dude. Um, it's not exactly just about casual murder, like killing somebody, you know, just like stabbing somebody or something isn't a big deal. Um, but apparently it's perfectly normal. Um, bad actors don't live long. How does that work? What's the process there? Are we talking about mob violence? Are we talking about private vendettas? Are we talking about, um, you know, a, a really harsh, um, you know, judiciary system? What are we talking? Well, we'll learn more about this as we go. But clearly, um, the um, uh, the casual references to the likelihood of this guy that he just met having just somebody's going to somebody's going to kill him sooner or later right he probably does not have a long life expectancy acting like this sooner or later someone's just going to eliminate this guy um elimination we've already seen it is the verb right it is the verb that's what you do that's that's what that's you, very rarely do you talk about... It, it, they do talk about killing people. They still use that verb. Um, but uh, eliminating is what you do to bad actors. Um, which means, what? Expelling them out. Remember, Luna's an indoor place. You, you push them to the outside, right? You eliminate them like a body eliminating waste, right? Um, that seems to me to be the metaphor. Uh, that he's talking about. I mean, on the one hand, it's simply eliminate, meaning get rid of, right? But again, it like to expel, right? They are um, um, these bad actors who get eliminated are um, like physical waste being eliminated from the body, um, and the rest of the body is the healthier for it. Uh, he tells us. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, and a couple of you are. Uh, Remembering the comment, an armed society is a polite society. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. In Though, interestingly, it's not armed, right? Uh, this is, well, and of course, it's a particularly tactless you, uh, word to use of uh, 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 Manny. Uh, well, he's armed with his number seven armor, wishing he were. Um, but um, uh, but they're, they're, they're not armed. They have no weapons, right? But they don't apparently need weapons, Especially not uh, with folks who behave nuchum. Um, I believe nuchum is the opposite of old cobber. 
that's the con that, that's what I'm getting from this quote, right? Um, old cobbers all know me. Um, but if you behave new chum, you're liable uh, to get your face smashed at the least or possibly eliminated. Um, yeah, agreed. Agreed, Arthur. Uh, uh, joke about Manny's arm is funny once. Um, all of the exterior of Luna is a weapon. Gregory, exactly. Exactly. Um, life is hard in Luna and death is easy. Um, there's a sense in which death is the default, right? Again, Luna's indoors. Um, Luna consists of those places that humans have made safe, right? Th th little pockets of safety. Um, and all the rest of it is deadly. Um, and you cannot, you cannot survive, not even forever, you know, with a pea suit, um, especially if something goes wrong with your pea suit, right? Um, your pressure suit. So, um, uh, yeah. And it also does make sense. Um, I agree. Who's that? Lazarus, um, that projectile weapons inside of, uh, pressure, a, a pressurized, uh, habitat is also not a, 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 a marvelous idea. I agree. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah. So, um, again, we get that sense, right? And again, one of the things, of course, that I'm always remembering, uh, in the first few chapters of a book is the title, right? In what sense is the moon a harsh mistress? Um, well, this is one sense, right? It's, uh, uh the moon is on an uncompromising place. Um, if you don't, you don't live by default, you die by default on the moon, right? You die unless you do things right. You die unless you are protected. Um, so the elimination of bad actors is contextualized almost as if it's not just like letting nature do its work, right? But it's like you, um, you are being, when you are living on the, in the moon, I almost said on, right? When you're living in the moon, um, you have, um, um, you are enjoying the active protection of the community. If you are a bad actor, that protection will be revoked. Again, the default is dying on the moon. Um, we've got to work to keep you alive. Even the air that you breathe, we've got, to, we've got to pump that in, right? Everything about what enables you to survive on the moon is an artificial environment maintained by the community, right? And so, yeah, that's their weapon, right? That's their weapon, and that's how they eliminate folks. Um, Ray, I agree. Uh, to make another Dune reference, Ray says, uh, it's like the Fremen from Dune, the planet has defined who they are and how they act. Yeah, and we can see that uh, in, uh, in this. So yeah, there's a way in which killing people in this way does seem to mean less to them, right? Um, because again, it's less of, it's not, it's the surviving that's the deviation from the norm, in a sense. Right. Um, again, survival is a gift. Uh, death is just what would naturally happen. Right. Uh, death is is your your sort of is, is what you're owed when you come to Luna. Right. Uh, that's what would know, that's what would happen. It's what will happen unless you're shielded from it by the dome. Right. Or by, you know, the underground tunnels with all of its air and air pressure and uh, and and water and all these other things. Um so, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, um, it helps to explain why they are all so casual about eliminating people, right? Um, if you forfeit your right to the society's, you know, you don't have a right, right? If you forfeit the society's protection, they're going to stop going out of their way to keep you alive, right? And that's what's going to happen. Okay, um... Yeah, David says elimination is basically ostracism taken to the greatest possible extreme. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay. Now, gender stuff. Um, why not? She was little only to Shorty. I am not short, 175 centimeters, but she was taller, 180. I learned later, and massed 70 kilos, all curves and as blonde as Shorty was black. 
I decided she must be transportee, since colors rarely stay that clear past first generation. Pleasant face, quite pretty, and mop of yellow curls topped off that long, blonde, solid, lovely structure. I stopped three paces away to look her up and down and whistle. She held her pose, then nodded to thank me, but abruptly, bored with compliments, no doubt. Shortly waited till formality was over, then said softly, Why, oh, this is Comrade Manny, best drillman that ever dr drifted a tunnel. Manny, this little girl is Wyoming not, and she came all the way from Plato to tell us how we're doing in Hong Kong. Wasn't that sweet of her? Okay. Um, so... My first reaction, when Manny stops three paces away, scopes her up and down and whistles at her, my first reaction was like, really? Really? That's, that's how we're being, right? But we get two immediate things, right? First, her reaction. Um, she held her pose, then nodded to thank me. He notes that she's slightly abrupt about it, which tells him some things about her. Right. She's bored with compliments. She gets this all the time. Right. Um, but um, she nods to thank him. And then secondly, it's referred to as a formality. Waited till formality over. Right. Um, Shorty is waiting. He's introducing her. Right. But first he pays this kind of respect to this formality, this ritual of looking her up and down and whistling at her, right? So, of course, my immediate associations with a man acting like that towards a woman is one of degradation, right? One of objectification. Um, one of a man um, sort of pushing his own you know, sexual desires and sexual attentions onto a woman who has not asked for them, right? That's my first associations with those actions. And that's why my first reaction is sort of repulsion in that moment, right? But what happens next, I think, is designed to make me question my assumptions about that, right? On the one hand, what we're told is that it's certainly not either an unexpected or like an unwanted, it's a formality, right? Which she expects, returns. Um, we will see this used later again. Um, Prof does it too, right? The extremely polite old guy, right? Who comes up in when he is introduced um, to, you know, formally, he's seen her from across the room, Right. But when she is like officially drawn to his attention, he does the same thing, the looking up and down and the whistling. Right. Um, and when I don't think I quoted that passage on a, on a slide, but I believe when Prof does it, the word that Manny uses to describe it is, is actually um, to show respect for her. Um, yeah, David, I agree this. We are led to understand that this is apparently the lunar equivalent of the Victorian process of kissing a woman's hand upon introduction. Absolutely. That's, I think, a great parallel. That's a great parallel. Um, and seems to be received in the same way, right? Again, like, you know, nowadays, if you you meet somebody and you kiss them, you know, you, you, you without solicitation, lay your lips upon her person, that's not going to go well, right? That's not going to be received um, in friendly fashion by the woman. But a, a Victorian lady would have expected it, right? And received it as a formality um, and even as a respect, right? So, yeah, I think that's a really good parallel. Um, and I think this is... In so, again, my first reaction is like, wow, this is... Um, it's a little bit shocking. And in some ways, I think that it is. I don't want to. But here's here. Here's what I want to ask. I want to ask because I think this is so important with all the things that we see in a in a story like this. Right. In a world like this. Make sure 
But we have to make sure before we condemn it, right? Before we start drawing conclusions about it, we have to make sure we understand it, right? What exactly is it pointing to? Um, and I believe, my theory is that Heinlein has chosen this particular ritual. He could have, there are a whole bunch of options, right? If he wanted to create an elaborate greeting ritual between men and women on in Luna, um, he, he had lots of options, right? He could have done many different things. He chose this one, I think, for a very particular reason. And I think the reason, he, I think he's laying a trap for us here. Um, and the trap is, watch it, earthworm, right? Be careful. Don't think like an earthworm, right? You're, you're going to be thinking like an earthworm. And if you're thinking like an earthworm, you're not necessarily going to be understanding this properly. Now, once we do understand it properly, you're perfectly welcome to condemn it if you like. But first, we have to make sure that we're understanding it properly. What does it show us about this society? And the first thing that I feel pretty clearly from this paragraph is that whatever it does mean, whatever it does tell us about the relationship between men and women in Luna it does not mean what it would mean uh, if, uh, you know, a 20th or 21st century man acted this way to an Earth woman. Um, whatever it means, it doesn't mean exactly the same thing as that, right? Um, so, I, and I, so again, exactly, um, exactly what that is and how that works, we only come to understand a little bit better uh, as we move through. Um, but remember also... Um, uh, remember also, yeah, Wendy, I, I can see, I, I, I hear you and I don't disagree with you, Wendy. I can hear, I, I totally understand your resistance to this. Um, I get it. And again, I'm not asking you to like it, but I am asking you to hold on because I have to say, Wendy, you're thinking like an earthworm in your comments. Um, you are absolutely seeing this through an earthbound lens. And first we have to understand the loony side. Then you can condemn it by all means. It's, it's, that's your, you are, you are, you are perfectly able to do that. But first we have to try to understand it. That's the one thing that I do sort of, uh, um, um, insist on Chris, great comment. And I don't want to lose that either. Um, Shorty's reference to her as little girl. Um, this little girl, is Wyoming not? Why does he call her that? What does that mean? Is it demeaning? Is it patronizing? Sounds like it, right? Sounds like it. Um, though I can't help but notice that the one who's saying this apparently patronizing thing is the, like, six foot six huge guy named Shorty <laughs> also, right? Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Carrie, that's a really good... Carrie says, patterns of behavior don't take meaning from the past, but from the community around it. Yeah, exactly. And again, I would I would come back to um, uh, David's uh, parallel to kissing a woman's hand, right, in Victorian England. Um, take that same action and put it into a totally different social circumstance, like a modern street corner, right? And it's, you know, like just you like meeting somebody running into someone, you know, meeting someone at a like a bus stop on a street corner, right, in a modern city. Uh, and, uh, you know, you say hi to, you know, to a, a woman and she says hi to you and you reach out and grab her hand and kiss it. Right. Like, let's see how that goes. Right. Yeah. Context. Context is everything. Right. It's it's about the context. And that's exactly what we need to try to understand. Um, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Now again, I'm not trying to resist what sounds like, um, well, what is explicitly diminutiveness, right? Little girl, right, is a diminutive expression, right? Um, she came all the way from Plato to tell us how we're doing in Hong. Wasn't that sweet of her, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't yet know how to contextualize that. I'm just going to take that as a piece of data. Right. And see how we can fit it into the rest of the data uh, that uh, uh, that we're going to that we're going to see. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's possible. 
Chris. It's possible that little girl does fall off the 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 rope that he's walking here. Um, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I can't know. I can't be confident in saying that one way or the other uh, until we get more data. But let's 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 try not try not to let me forget about that speech from Shorty, especially given what we learn. And I, I, we won't, I won't quote this, um, but um, especially what we learn about um, what what we learn about their relationship. Shorty and Wyo's relationship, I mean. Um, she considers him one of her best friends, she says later, um, and uh, speaks of him with very great affection. Um, so what does that tell us? How does that enter into it? I don't know. But that's one piece of context we do have to remember. Um, okay. Um, another. More learning. More learning about the culture. Um, here we learn some things about Earth. Right, it's uh, 2075 when this stuff is happening here. Um, so, uh, what's happened in the last hundred years on Earth? Before travel became cheap, many people in Luna City and, no and Novelen thought that Hong Kong Luna was all Chinese. But Hong Kong was as mixed as we were. Great China dumped what she didn't want there. First from old Hong Kong and Singapore, then Aussies and Enzies and Blackfellows and Marys and Malays and Tamil and name it. Even old Bolshies from, Vla from Vladivostok and Harbin and Ulaanbaatar. Why looked Svenska and had British last name with North American first name, but could have been Rusky? My word, a loony, a loony then rarely knew who father was, and if raised in creche, might be vague about mother. We are told some explicit things about loony society here, right? The mixture. Which, of course, we could hear. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I actually laughed aloud the first time I heard his full name, right? Manuel Garcia O'Kelly, uh, especially Manuel Garcia O'Kelly Davis, right? I mean, that's a loony name, right? It's a very, very loony name. Um, and uh, that's. We, again, we can see a lot just from his name, right? Um, uh, as um, what does he say? As uh, as mixed as we were, yes. Hong Kong was as mixed as we were. Um, people in Novilen who don't usually go to Hong Kong Luna, um, the, you know this other city which is fairly remote, um, are under the vague impression that uh, everybody in Hong Kong Luna is all Chinese. Um, but uh, but no, it isn't so. Hong Kong Luna was apparently the settlement, and the reason it's further away is that it was established by the Chinese, right? So Great China, which I assume, by the way, I assume I'm supposed to hear Great China as parallel to Great Britain, right? That Great China, so we, we see that there has grown a Chinese empire, right? That China now controls not only Hong Kong and Singapore, but also Australia, um, and uh, what New Zealand and Malays and Tamil and name it right and Bolshe. So you know Russia, India, uh, you know the 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 uh, Polynesian islands, uh, Australia, right? Uh, China has built an empire there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Right, David, I agree. Um, there's a lot here that modern... I, I would myself have to have looked up a whole bunch of these to even know what he's talking about, right? But that he's very casually familiar with. Um, as David says, most English readers could probably guess Rusky, but how many people, uh, you know, how many, how many, you know, like American readers know that Svenska uh, means Swedish? Right, she looked Svenska. Right. She looks uh, Scandinavian. Right. Um, but could have been Rusky. Um, where does he end up at the end of this paragraph? A loony rarely knew who father was. And if raised in crash might be vague about mother. Um, they are a completely polyglot society, linguistically polyglot, ethnically polyglot. Um, uh, notice how he suspects that she's only recently because she might be a transportee. Uh, to Luna, 
um, because she's still blonde. And normally after a couple of generations of mixing around, uh, very few people um, uh, still look as 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 purely Nordic as she looks. Right. Um, yeah. Um, Arthur says, what are Mary's? I don't know what Mary's are. Black fellows and Mary's? No idea. No idea. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Really? Michael says Mary's are homosexuals? Really? Did not know that slang. Okay. Interesting. No idea. So this is the list, of course, of people who get sent up to the moon by Great China. China dumped what she didn't want there. Okay. Okay. Right, Stephen. Yes, it does make sense then that Mary's is not capitalized in that list. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and I, I do assume that the black fellas in question there, uh, Chris, are people like uh, um, Australian uh, uh, indigenous folks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, that kind of thing. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay. There we go. Okay. Um, interesting. That's a new one on me. Um, but... Um, uh, okay. But again, remember Manny's paragraph about how proud he is of his heritage, right? Um, when he says Hong Kong was as mixed as we were, that's solidarity, right? Um, that Hong Kong is not this, you know, city full of pure blood Chinese people, um, like a lot of people in Novi Land assume. Um, they're as mixed as we were. And he seems to be fine with that. Again, just as he is proud of his ancestor, uh, who was uh, uh, a witch in Salem, right? Uh, he is completely accepts the basis of lunar society as all of those that, that on Terra were deemed undesirable and sent up to Luna. Um, there is no shadow of shame about that. Um, uh, and that's the, it's, it's like the very premise in many ways um, of this, uh, of this society. I agree, Curtis. One of the reasons I would never have guessed um that Mary is meant homosexual in that uh, in that sentence is it it does seem every other term there seems to be either national or racial. Um, I mean, I can understand it in the context of um, you know who Great China might have thought undesirable and dumped on the loon, on on the moon. I mean, I can understand it in that context. Um, Again, especially in the context in which, you know, Manny is sort of welcoming the whole mix. But um, but it is it is it is odd. It is odd in that way. Um, right. I was wondering that was the only guess that I had. Alyssa. Is it could is uh, Mary's could Mary's be a. a kind of bastardization of. uh of Maoris. That would make it fit better in that list. Right? And it would be, it would make a lot of sense that, um, uh, it would make a lot of sense that he would include it in that list, therefore. I agree, Wendy, it would be capitalized then. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe if it capitalizes it, it just looks like, <laughs> you know, people named Mary. I don't know. Uh, but, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. In either case, I'm sure that at the very least, if he's not explicitly, if like he, Manny, is not explicitly referring uh, to homosexuals, I can easily see 
um, Heinlein kind of using that term again to kind of talk about, you know, the those who are condemned and outcast by the earth. Um, again, setting up the way we have lunar society and Terran society in contrast with each other, right? Um, you know, Luna is the ultimate, like, you know, give me give me your poor, you know, give me your hungry. Um, uh, all of those people who are rejected on Earth end up in Luna, right? Where they all apparently can be accepted as long as they're good actors, right? Uh, if you're a bad actor, you'll get eliminated. But, um, but you know, if you uh, uh, show that you're worth the air that you breathe, they're not going to judge you based on, you know, who you are, where you came from, or what your background was. Um, that contrast, I think, um, seems, seems important in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, again, I get several of you guys are trying to convince me. I do not. I'm not doubting you about the homosexual thing. Not doubting you at all. But I am not 100 percent convinced from context that that's how Manny means it when he says it. Um, is uh, the particular way that that word is turned at the very least, I would say that the that if he does mean like the Maoris, um, uh, and, you know, Manny is kind of turning as he's, you know, slanging, uh, you know, a few others like Enzies um, and Bolshies uh, and things like that, um, that um, at the very least, Heinlein was kind of hinting at that kind of inclusion or rather um, the use of that term, which would have been used in his contemporary 1960s culture as an insulting way to refer to homosexuals is, I think, his way of indicting Earth society, basically. Um, yeah, that attitude, the kind of culture that labels people that way and talks about people that way, that's Terra all over, right? Um, and very different from, from the moon. So... Um, I think that NZs are New Zealanders. Yeah, like NZ, New Zealand. Um, that's my guess. Anyway, especially as they're juxtaposed with Aussies there. Um, so, yeah, I think so. So, again, we, we see that kind of slangification, right, uh, of the term there. Um, but um, anyway, OK. Um, running out of time. Going to finish at least one theme, though. This is, uh, we're in the hotel room now with uh, Wyo and Manny. After pause for medicine, uh, meaning her uh, drink, right? Um, after pause for medicine, she's drinking a martini, I think. After pause for medicine, she went on, Manny, you're married, yeah? Da. It shows. Notice that, the ya yeah and the da, right? The, again, the uh, various linguistic melding there. Quite. You're nice to a woman, but not eager and quite independent. So you're married and long married. Children? Seventeen divided by four. Clan marriage? Line. Opted at fourteen, and I'm fifth of nine. So seventeen kids is normal. Big family. It must be nice. I've never seen much of line families, not many in Hong Kong. Plenty of clans and groups and lots of polyandries, but the line way never took hold. Is nice. Our marriage nearly a hundred years old. Dates back to Johnson City and first transportees. Twenty-one links. Nine alive today. Never a divorce. Oh, it's a madhouse when our descendants and in-laws and kinfolk get together for birthday or wedding. More kids than seventeen, of course. We don't count them after they marry. Or I'd have children old enough to be my grandfather. Happy way to live. Never much pressure. Take me. Nobody woofs if I stay away a week and don't phone. Welcome when I show up. Line marriages rarely have divorces. How could I do better? I don't think you could. Is it an alteration? And what's the spacing? Spacing has no rule. Just what suits us. Been alternation up to latest link last year. We married a girl when alternation called for boy, but was special. And then he explains about the special circumstance. Okay. So, yeah, Stephen, 
it took me several readings before I really understood how line marriage <laughs> works. Um, and this is one place where I find myself, again, thinking like an earthworm a lot. Um, and finding myself being kind of startled by by particular references. Um, so, okay. The line marriage, let me see if I can explain it based on what he says here. Um, what he says is sort of uh, clear enough, but only once you have the context that you get from meeting more of Manny's family and seeing how they interact later on. Uh, so a line marriage is a marriage that gets passed down, right? So you've got multiple men and women who are married in a communal group. Um, and they have children, and the children are part of the family. But when the children get married outside the family, they're not counted anymore as children. They've, 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 they've left the family now. Um, and it's a line marriage because, you know, the, the, there's the, the, the eldest... Uh, we've got the, the person who's in charge, right? The, there's a hierarchical leader of the family. Um, I'm being deliberately vague about this because it's not mentioned here. Um, and so I'm trying to stay within the context of this. Um, and new people can opt in. So he says, I, uh, when he says opted at 14, that's when he, he married, he got married. Um, he opted in, uh, meaning that he, he chose, uh, to be, he was opted at 14. Um, so he was chosen. He was allowed in to the, to the marriage. Um, at 14. And so there's generations of people, as we will learn, his eldest wife, the senior wife of the family, is old enough to be his grandmother. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so his, um, the alternation and the spacing is, is it, an, is it an alteration? That is, do you alternate male and female when you opt new spouses into the marriage? And he says, um, been alteration up to latest link. So this last person who opted, uh, who, who was opted, this last person who, uh, uh, who was married was a girl in alternation called for boy. Um, so they're, they're a little girl heavy right now. Uh, because they they're not they're not evenly balanced, and spacing has no rules. So in some line marriages, perhaps there would be rules to say like once every five years, ten years, whatever the spacing is, um, they will take a new one. So that again, there's this continual um, set of spouses. So the marriage that's why he says the marriage is nearly a hundred years old, right? The marriage is longer than any is older than any of the uh, the people in it. Um, one would think. Um, it has 21, 21 links, nine alive today, and never a divorce. So nine alive today. So he has nine, or is he one of nine? I think he's one of nine spouses in the line marriage. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good, David, I agree. We saw a glimpse of a clan marriage earlier on, and the difference seemed to be... Uh, the balance, right? Um, with a clan marriage, there were six men and two women. Um, that was his uh, grandmother, right? Who uh, who was uh, transported for delinquency, juvenile del delinquent female type, um, uh, and she opted into a clan marriage. Was one of and chose his grandpappy. Remember, um, yes. Yes. Okay. So, right. Four men, five women. Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, and he is right now in the middle, Carrie. I, yeah. There are four older than him and four younger than him, uh, right now. Um, so he is, she is certainly correct that he is married and long married. And as she calls him just a little bit later in this scene, um, he is much married as well. Um, he's been married since he was 14. Um, he is married to four, uh, uh, he has four wives and four co-husbands. Um, and this is the way it works. So 
the, we've seen hints and glimpses that like social structure is different in the moon. How is social structure different? Social structure is different. Well, again, one of the themes that we see, just as in the previous slide, we were looking at how um, the moon is this uh, combination of different, different cultures and people, right? Like nobody is a pure blood anything. Everybody is mixed, right? Everybody has this mixture of, you know, Spanish, Irish, Welsh names, right? Um, it's, uh, that's normal. Uh, that's normal. Uh, and um, so he can't even really guess what, you know, uh, Wyo's, um, you know, uh, ancestry is or exactly how long she's been she's been in Luna. Um, but uh, but we see that this goes all the way down to the social structures. Right. Um, it's not that everyone is in a line marriage. Um, what, it's significant that Wyo has never actually seen one. She's never met one. Um, because they don't do it that way. They do clan marriages and, and other things uh, in Hong Kong, right? Clan marriage and uh, polyandries and groups. Um, and we don't know exactly the rules uh, for all of those. Um, but it's clear that what is unusual in Luna is an exclusive marriage between one man and one woman. Um, Wyo characterizes that as earthworm style. One man and one woman is earthworm style. Um, she, when she tells the story of her previous marriage, she is divorced. Um, but, uh, when she tells the story of her marriage, um, she speaks of marrying two husbands, right? She took two husbands, two twin brothers. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, Chris, it does seem that marriage is more about creating, um, and economically, and I would add socially viable family, uh, family unit than about earthworm conventional patterns uh, of romance. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, right. So again, we've, we've gotten glimpses of this kind of thing. This is, uh, you know, Stephen, this is one of the passages that I get to one of the pieces of exposition in these first three chapters where I'm like, whoa, hang on, I got to back up and listen to that again. Right? Uh, OK, because I didn't follow that whole thing, um, especially since they are um, especially since they are using terminology, which is familiar, right? Husband and wife, grandmother, grandfather, um, and everything, you know, they, they use familiar term, but they use it in completely different ways. And that's the last thing I want to touch on. And then I'll let you go. Um, when he calls in to the head wife of his family, um, whom he calls mum. Uh, a moment later, I said, mum, this is your favorite husband. Which, OK, so that sentence makes me twitch again. Right. Um, because I'm getting all kinds of cog cognitive dissonance. Um, he calls her mum, like you're speaking to your mom, uh, like you're speaking to your own mother. And then he introduces himself as her favorite husband. OK, she answered, Manuel, are you in trouble again? I love mum more than any other woman, including my other wives. But she never stopped bringing me up. Bog willing, she never will. I tried to sound hurt. Me? Why, you know me, mum. I do indeed. Since you are not in trouble, perhaps you can tell me why Professor de la Paz is so anxious to get in touch with you. He has called three times, and why he wants to reach some woman with unlikely name of Wyoming not, and why he thinks you might be with her. Have you taken a bundling companion, Manuel, without telling me? We have freedom in our family, dear, but you know that I prefer to be told, so that I will not be taken unawares. Mum was but her co-wives, and never, never, never admitted it. I said, Mum, bog strike me dead. I have not taken a bundling companion. Very well. You've always been a truthful boy. Now, what's this mystery? Um, the cognitive dissonance just like builds <laughs> throughout this whole passage, right? I, I mean, like the whole tone of voice <clears throat> in which the, the whole context of this conversation, right? And the whole tone of this conversation is a mother-son conversation. Right. All the way through um, uh, the posture, the posture that she has towards him, the posture that he has towards her. Um, the dynamics are completely familiar. Uh, mom to grown up son whom she still thinks of as her son. And, uh, you know, and the, 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 the kind of the, 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 the dynamics of their interactions. Um, 
and yet the explicit but but their husband and wife right she is the head wife of his family she, he is one of her husbands um this is your favorite husband uh and then with her uh her sexual jealousy right at the end mom was always jealous of all women but her co-wives um it's um it's very odd it's very, this feels very odd. This is one of the places where I am feeling imposed upon, right? I am feeling imposed. Upon, and, and again, I'm feeling imposed upon in a way which is pushing me, right? Pushing me to, which is drawing attention to, and I find this scene very effective in drawing attention to my earthworm prejudices, right? Um, I, I am separating those two roles, Right. Um, the role that she is in, she is bringing him up, right? She is the head wife of his of his family. She is decades older than he is. Um, she is in the social position. There's a reason why the dynamic sounds so much like mother and son. There's a reason for that. Because it's exactly the same. That's precisely the relationship that she has with him. Almost all. Right. That is as far as like the authority that she has over him, the nurturing relationship that she has with him, um, the you know, she is the authority that he answers to. She never stopped bringing me up. Right. Um, it's not just that his relationship with this wife is kind of creepily maternal. No, it's very explicitly in that role. But your mom doesn't bring you up this way. Right. It's or rather this is the prerogative of the head wife. Even as we will see, even people whose mothers are in the family, the head wife treats them this way too. She's the one who's bringing them up. This is her job. She's the head mother. She's, she's the head wife, excuse me. She's the head wife. Um, so it's, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Carrie, uh, she's known him since he was 14. She's been married to him since he was 14. She's probably known him a good deal longer than that. Um, but he has been her husband since he was 14. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... See, Mudmore... Mudmore on Twitch says, maybe head mother is a better term. See, I'm tempted to say uh, that's true, right? But that's because it would make me more comfortable, <laughs> right? Because it would ease some of the cognitive dissonance that I'm having, right? But again, what I think that Heinlein is plainly challenging us with here is to imagine a society that is legitimately different in these ways, right? That does not have the same kind of firewalls that we have, right? A social structure which works in a completely different way. I find it very challenging. I find it difficult. Um, and I keep finding myself slipping back into earthworm patterns uh, when I'm, uh, when I, especially with mom. Mom is the one who, uh, who, who kind of makes me twitch throughout the entire story. Um, But um, but again, as I said before, you don't you're not obligated to like it. But I do feel um, that if we're going to read the story, we are obligated to try to understand it um, and to try to understand the terms in which it's uh, in which it's describing things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so. Um, and yeah, St uh, Stephen, he did first tell and then show, right? This this scene comes very soon after his conversation with Wyo, um, ex his explanation of line marriage and how their marriage works. Um, and then we see it in action. Um, and Stephen, I'm awful glad he did, because my uh, my bog, as he would say, um, I have no idea. Don't ask me what bog is. I have no idea who or what bog is. Um, but anyway, um, uh, he... Um, 
it, had, I, had I just gotten this phone conversation before I'd gotten the explanation of blind marriage, I'm really not sure how I'd have handled that at all. Um, see, Arthur, Bog does seem to equal God, except he uses the word God. Manny uses the word God. Um, he doesn't use the word Bog all the time. He uses the word God. Um, sometimes. I don't really know. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't understand the, the, I'm trying to, it's one of the things I'm trying to figure out this reading through that I'm paying attention to. Um, Bog is the more common one, but when he uses, um, God and why, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, anyway, okay. It's late and I'm keeping you guys late. All right. Um, that was fun. <sighs> Let's experiment with reading two more chapters for next time. So read uh, through chapter five uh, for session number two. I still got some things on chapter one to three I want to talk about with much more efficiency than I did this evening. The, the first world building thing is always the hardest part. Don't worry. It's going to get way more efficient after this. Um, but let's go ahead and, and add chapters four and five uh, uh, to the pot for next time. Uh, and we will uh, we will. We will continue. Thanks, everybody. And I will talk to you guys. I will see you guys next week. Bye now.